Hello everyone, Stucky here. And now why do the Greeks and Turks hate each other? Yeah, oh boy, this is probably going to be a little bit of a spicy one, but hey, that is always what happens when we end up talking about rivals. For anyone that is watching this right now, you have probably seen or heard about the ongoing dispute between Greece and Turkey over a series of Aegean islands. The story behind this dispute is that Turkey alleges that Greece has been building up a military presence on these islands, which is in violation of international treaties that would guarantee the unarmed status of them. Meanwhile, on the other hand, Greece maintains that Turkey has deliberately misinterpreted those treaties, adding that it has the legal grounds to defend itself. Between the two now, threats have been traded, in particular from Turkey, with statements such as, If Athens does not want peace, Ankara will do whatever is necessary. We cannot remain silent about the disarmament of the islands. We will take the necessary steps, both legally and on the ground. This coming from Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Kavasoglu. And this is not something that started just this last week. In late April of 2022, these two NATO allies were trading barbs with each other about airspace violations over the Aegean Sea. Greece had informed NATO about a series of overflights in the Aegean Sea by Turkish fighter jets. Turkey then retaliated by saying, oh no, Greece was the one that was actually instigating tensions by carrying out provocative flights near Turkish coasts. But while what we've been talking about here is over one issue, the actual rivalry and the story behind it between Turkey and Greece, that goes back a significantly longer amount of time. Now I say that, but in other videos that are about this same kind of topic, what you'll typically see from people or articles is them saying that the rivalry goes back over 2000 years, something to the 5th century BC during the Greco-Persian Wars. But really, that's not accurate. It is true that the Greeks have always held a kind of rivalry with those that were in the Near East. But specifically, in the ancient times, that was with the Persians, not the Turks. They are completely different peoples. Thus, in order to answer the question, we have to look at things a little more recently in history. You see, modern or recent Greece was something that was only established after a very intense war with the Ottoman Empire in the early 19th century. Prior to this conflict, there really was no such state as Greece. Only an idea of Greece with its people controlled by varying empires over the last 2,000 years. After the fall of Constantinople to the Ottomans in 1453, the Despotate of Moria was the last remnant of the Greek-speaking Byzantine Empire to hold out against the Ottomans. However, that too fell to the Ottomans in 1460, completing the conquest of mainland Greece. For the next four centuries, the entirety of Greece would remain under Ottoman control. Sometimes this was more benevolent and absent-minded control, sometimes it was not. But that right there is probably an entire other video itself. Either way, the short of it was that the Greeks wanted out. They wanted their own state. And so this then brings us to the Greek Independence War, something that was driven by both the rising nationalism of the Greek people against the Ottoman Empire, as well as the Christian enthusiasm against Islam. And after eight years of terrible and bloody struggle, they were finally free. Turkey, on the other hand, did not immediately appear out of the Ottoman Empire. Rather, modern Turkey was established more so out of the military victories that were against Greece's military invasion in the coastal areas of western Turkey after the First World War. Not many people are aware of this, thinking that there was simply peace in Europe after World War I, but the reality of it is not the case. Under the leadership of Kemal Ataturk, the founding father of modern Turkey, the new Turkish military forces directed by nationalism would successfully expel Greek forces in 1923. These would then go on and set up modern Turkey. Now, I'm saying all of this rather succinctly, but the reality of it was that the war was anything but clean. The war between Turkey and Greece was accompanied by ethnic cleansing on both sides, both in the Turkish-dominated areas as well as the Greek-dominated areas. And the ethnic hatred that both sides would feel for one another after the war, well, that is something that simply wasn't going to just go away. The hatred and the distrust would then only be compounded by the Cyprus issue of the 1960s and 70s, something that would then lead to further conflict. We're going to sum it up rather quickly here, but the idea of it is that there were two ethnic groups in Cyprus. You had Turkish people and you had Greek people, and these were driven by rising nationalism until finally a conflict would break out in it. Again, that itself is also likely an entire other video, one that would need to be done extensively. But to sum it up in the end, Turkey and Greece blamed each other for Cyprus's conflict, and the entire thing was never fully resolved. Cyprus was separated into a Turkish-controlled Northern Cyprus in the north, and an internationally recognized Republic of Cyprus in the south. 
And it was all of these conflicts and more that would lead to further points of contention in the Aegean Sea, where we see the issues of today happening. You see, inside of the Aegean Sea, which spreads out over 200,000 square kilometers, there are thousands of islands, most of which are controlled by Greece. But there are a few that are controlled by Turkey. Some of those Greek islands are actually within two kilometers of the Turkish mainland itself, which if you combine with the constant territorial disputes, would naturally lead to great distrust and anxiety between the two. In fact, the two powers came to the brink of war in 1996 over a pair of uninhabited islets in the Aegean Sea, then referred to as the Imia Islets in Greece and as Kardak in Turkey. What had happened was that a Turkish cargo ship had run aground in Imia in December of 1995, and both countries rushed to salvage it. Turkey rejected Greece's help and its sovereignty over Imia. Shortly after, both countries then moved their navies towards Imia, resulting in a standoff that spilled over into January of 1996. The issue naturally attracted international concern as both countries began to mobilize their forces for war. However, thankfully, global intervention would prevent further escalation. And so you may wonder at this point, why do they care so much? It's just a couple of little islands. Does it really actually mean anything when a bunch of these are uninhabited in the first place? Well, yeah, control over these islands is actually exceptionally important for both powers over their zones of economic control. But that's going to need a little bit more explaining. You see, it was in 1995 that Greece went and ratified the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or the UNCLOS, which provides a legal framework in order to recognize the limits of maritime zones of coastal nations. While over 160 countries are party to the treaty, Turkey did not sign it as it did not favor its interests in the Aegean Sea. The reason for that is, according to the UNCLOS, the sovereignty of a coastal country extends beyond its land territory and internal waters to an adjacent belt of sea described as the Territorial Sea. A country's territorial sea would extend to 12 nautical miles from the baseline of its coast, and it has sovereign rights over it. And when Greece has islands that are quite literally within two kilometers of the Turkish mainland, then you start to see where there could be a little bit of a problem. At the current time, Turkey does claim a territorial sea of six nautical miles, and it hasn't exercised its claim over the 12 nautical miles from its coast in the Aegean Sea. But after the Greek parliament adopted the UNCLOS in 1995, Turkey retaliated. They retaliated by authorizing its government to take necessary steps, including military action, if Greece would try to extend its rights to 12 nautical miles. So in 1974, in a separate Aegean Sea-linked issue, Turkey had formally said that if Greece fully extended its territorial waters, that would count as a casus belli, a cause for war. Some people may still be a little bit confused from that, so to elaborate, what the Turkish government is saying is that if Greece actually went and exerted its 12 nautical miles of control, it would end up controlling two-thirds of the Aegean Sea and would drive Turkey out of waters that are it's by right, and also stop it from accessing international waters that it would need for trade and simultaneously resource rights. It is very contentious. But okay, you may ask, what has that to do with this whole issue with this treaty? What is this treaty that is talking about? What are the violations that are occurring? Why is this conflict happening? Well, that all goes back to the Lausanne Treaty of 1923, something that was signed at the end of the First World War in order to settle the conflict between Turkey, which was the successor of the Ottoman Empire, and the allied powers, including Greece. The treaty defined the boundaries of Turkey and Greece, and several islands, islets, and other major territories in the Aegean Sea, beyond three miles from the Turkish coast, were ceded to Greece. That being with the exception of three groups of islands. And this is the important part. Under the terms of the treaty and the Lausanne Convention of 1923, Greece was obligated to keep these islands demilitarized, the treaty also opened up civilian shipping passage in the Turkish Straits, and it mandated that Turkey was to demilitarize the Straits. Turkey also had to cede Cyprus to the British. And so years later, at the end of the Second World War, as part of the Paris Peace Treaties of 1947, the Dodecanese Islands, which are a group of 12 islands in the Aegean Sea, these were given to Greece, again with the obligation of permanent and total demilitarization. They had been ceded to Italy back in 1923. 
But the conflict in this case comes from the fact that although Turkey recognizes these treaties, Greece says that Turkey has misinterpreted them. Greece argues that the 1936 Montreux Convention regarding the regime of the Straits superseded the Lausanne Treaty on the Straits as it gave Turkey the power to militarize the Turkish Straits, hence nullifying the obligation that Greece would have to demilitarize the Aegean Islands. Which leads us to right now in the language that you're probably seeing in the news. Turkey has cited the Lausanne and Paris treaties, arguing that Greece is violating them by increasing its military presence on the Aegean Islands. On the other hand, Greece is arguing that some of these islands, which have been garrisoned for decades, have troops because they are in close proximity to the Izmir coast, where Turkey has been deploying a large landing force called the Fourth Army, which, in theory, would make it capable of seizing Greek islands. Greece is arguing that it has a military presence in these islands for the purpose of self-defense, because after Turkey's invasion of Cyprus in the 1970s, Greece did militarize the Dodecanese Islands near Turkey for defensive purposes. And as neither side really trusts one another, this is something that could only lead to conflict. At the current time, the Greek islands of Rhodes, Kos, and Lesbos in the Aegean Sea, which are all near the Turkish coast, they would meet the description of militarized. As for what Turkey would do in order to rectify this matter or what will happen, we don't really know. But that remains to be seen here in the future, and that right there is the origin of the Greco-Turkish rivalry. Thank you to everyone who has watched this video. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Put your suggestions down in the comment section below for what kind of rivalry we should be doing next, or any other ideas that you would have on history videos that you would like. This is Takui with the History of Everything, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Goodbye, guys.